our next speaker has really quite uh, distinguished herself. So in a storm like this COVID storm that we're all bracing ourselves right now, we look for beacons of light to guide us to a safe harbor. And fortunately, our next speaker took it upon herself to serve as a lighthouse to many and has consistently been a voice of reason. Christina Pagel is, operational, is Professor of Operational Research at UCL and Director of the Clinical Operational Research Unit, which applies data science to analyze healthcare problems and to find better solutions. Um, moreover, not only is she an applied, uh, world-class applied mathematician, uh, but was also instrumental in helping both the public and professional groups uh, to understand how to account for complexity in congenital heart surgery when numbers were showing, or at least suggesting, that some of the world's leading children's hospitals had the highest mortality rates. In May of this year, she joined Independent Sage and used those very skills to inform the public discourse around the UK's response to the pandemic. And I'm delighted to invite her onto the stage to reflect on what role data science played in that experience. So, Christina, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so, can everyone see that screen? Yeah. So this is um, a talk. I mean, it is, it is mainly what I've learned through Independent Sage, but it's about what the biggest issues have been in COVID and where data science can help. And one of the really important things is it's also about where data science um, can't help. So just a very brief outline. I'm just going to start with one slide on things that have gone right, because I think, you know, we have to celebrate the things that have gone right. It's is only one slide, though. <laughs> but then the rest of it is kind of on where things have gone wrong, where the challenges have been, and where data science could help, um, has helped or could help in the future. Um, and then kind of just summarize the, the main learning that I've had over the last six, seven months. So things that have gone right. One of them is, is the trials for new treatments. And we really have seen science at its best. And, and Britain has been amazing and with the recovery trial where they've tried out lots of different things. And it's been really successful in finding new treatments that work, but also make finding the treatments that don't work, which is just as important when you're looking at a new disease. And so people who get COVID now are much less likely to die than they were in March. And that is a really big achievement for a disease that has now been around for only a year. Modeling, I think, has been a success um, in, in COVID. I mean, SPY-M have been producing models and scenarios for the government ever since, you know, January. Um, and it's been incredibly difficult to do it with changing evidence and a lot of uncertainty. But I think they have guided or provided good advice that hasn't always been taken. Um, there's also been kind of more issues with modeling. There's been lots of different types of modeling some better than others and I think that that has also that has actually been a little bit problematic we worked out pretty quickly who was at risk of COVID and I think that has been really important that's kind of your classic medical stats kind of um kind of data science but that was actually just crucial understanding you know who gets sick from COVID what are the risk factors who is it that we actually really need to protect and then finally you know like um vaccine and test development I mean again Yes, a lot of that is, is biochemistry and, and biomedicine, but a lot of that also is data science, like really hard data science to kind of come up with, with new vaccines. Um, and that's been, I mean, it's amazing. It's the quickest we've ever developed a vaccine. And now we have three really, really promising vaccines that are close to fin final um, rollout. So things that have gone wrong. Um, so I'm gonna start with logistics. Um, and the first one was obviously PPE, and this wasn't by any means just the UK, but it was a problem. We didn't stockpile enough. We didn't move quickly enough in February to secure more PPE. Um, we then had lots of contracts for PPE, many of which didn't work, and the BPE wasn't good enough. Um, and it also meant that we didn't recognize that you needed it outside of hospitals. You needed it in care homes, you needed it in, um, in public facing roles. And, and that did cause a lot of problems. ICU beds and ventilators was a really big issue in March. Everyone was panicking after the um, kind of data coming out of Italy where they really, really struggled with beds in Northern Italy. 
And then the, you know, the government launched in with its ventilator challenge for ICU beds, but it, it was kind of quite model thinking and they didn't actually involve ICU clinicians in setting out what ventilators they needed. And that meant that actually a lot of the plans that were approved are actually not suitable for patients with COVID. And that was a big problem. And it was actually kind of a, a lot of people and a lot of goodwill went into meeting a challenge that was actually unlikely to help. Um, and we also then kind of built the Nightingale hospitals and it was all kind of very reactive to the current issue. Whereas actually maybe we needed to have a bit of a, a more thoughtful thinking about, is it about clean hospitals versus kind of COVID hospitals? Is it, is it acute beds or is it ICU beds that we need um, and so on. And it kind of, there were also a lot of knock-on effects from COVID which came, which seemed to come as a surprise and actually did cause a lot of problems in the spring. Um, for instance, a lot, um, about 30% of ICU patients with COVID end up needing kidney dialysis or kidney, or, or kidney fluids. And that meant that they ended up having to take supplies from dialysis patients. And there was a kind of this big supply shortage. And there was also problems about transferring patients between hospitals, between who was organizing ambulances. I mean, all of that kind of logistics was very muddled and caused a lot of stress and um, some harm during the first pandemic, uh, the first wave of the pandemic. And then there's staff. I mean, we built the Nightingale hospitals and we, we built some ventilators and we built, you know, like um, breathing masks, which are really important. But if you don't have the staff, it doesn't help you. And you can't build staff in two weeks. And, and this is kind of where you had very different resources in different countries. Some countries had really good resources um, in terms of staffing and some didn't. And, and the UK in that sense kind of did end up kind of reaping the consequences of having kind of disinvested a bit in its healthcare services. And I put in vaccine distribution, not because it's gone wrong and it might go very right, but because it is a massive logistical challenge. And it's not just about the cold chain. Um, it's also about how do you distribute it nationally? Where are the priorities? How do you actually meet those priorities? How do you communicate around it? And how do you monitor the impact of vaccination? Um, so data and science, data science actually, I think can help with all of this and not necessarily kind of um, AI or machine learning, but certainly things around network analyses. So important for national distribution and national coordination, which is what you need in this kind of situation. Um, also thinking about knock-on effects, that's where network analysis can be really helpful. Your kind of classic optimization techniques, you know, mainstay of all logistics, really important for this kind of stuff. And I'm not sure they were used um, at the time, or at least not as well as they could have been. But for this, data is a massive problem and data is a problem for everything. There's actually, hospitals have very little data on their staffing, very little electronic data on their staffing. They might have it on pieces of paper, but if you actually say, how many nurses do you have on shift here and here and here, they can't often answer it. Um, if you're actually thinking about reorganizing a hospital to be kind of have clean areas and dirty areas, change physical spacing and stuff, you need things like floor plans. Hospitals gen tend not to have it or the clinicians tend not to know where they can get a floor plan from. I mean, they're really basic things. Um, a lot of the problems with ventilators, PPE, knock-on effects is not having the right people in the room, not having the people who would know, for instance, that kidney problems are a really common side effect of being in ICU. Um, and the kind of the planners, if it's just modelers, if it's just data scientists, you don't know what you don't know and you don't know who the right people are. And that actually can be a real hindrance um, when you're trying to kind of tackle such a big challenge. So moving on to the next kind of things that have gone wrong um, is data. And I feel like particularly in the UK, our response has been hampered throughout by a lack of data about crucial parameters um, and a lack of understanding about what that data meant and not necessarily within the data science community, but within the policy making community. And you could argue that it's our job to do that communication. So one of the key problems is asymptomatic versus symptomatic transmission. Um, and it's been, obviously it's a really difficult problem to get data on, but it really matters. And one of the reasons COVID has been so damaging is the asymptomatic spread. It makes it incredibly hard to stop. And I think there's been a lot of kind of discussion about, oh, asymptomatics aren't as infectious and there's concentration on just finding and isolating symptomatic people. But the problem is you have to think more broadly than that. 
the thing, well, it's not just about how infectious you are, but how likely you are to infect people. So if I'm sick, I might be more infectious because I'm coughing and spluttering or whatever, but I'm also much less likely to go out. I'm much more likely to be in my bed and actually not affecting anyone else except maybe my husband. If I'm asymptomatic, I may be less infectious, but I'm out interacting with tens of people every day. And that's where asymptomatic spread becomes so important. It's not about how infectious you are. It's about if you're infectious, you actually are in contact with loads more people. Um, and this is where I think we've really missed the trick with our contact tracing is that we've never tried to do contact tracing in um, together with research. You know, contact tracing by definition finds or you know, it gets people who had a positive test and tells them to isolate and gets in touch with them. But then we don't get in touch with them again. We don't find out how ill they are, what happened to them, whether their household members got infected, where they, you know, who, which of their contacts got infected and then you might work out where we wanted to transmit, who's asymptomatic, who isn't. There was this massive amount of information that was there in this basically this research cohort that just has not been used. And the Royal Statistical Society published um, a couple of things, but you know, one of them was this task force statement on how and how to improve data intelligence from test and trace um, over the summer. And it was really, really good. And it, and it, and it hasn't, to my knowledge, been implemented. The other issue um, with data is, isn't so much that this is a wrong thing, but that there are really important lags in data and they have really big impacts on policy. And I don't think people, a lot of people have really grasped that. So the fact that it takes five to seven days before you get symptoms if you're infected, but you're actually infectious a couple of days before that. So you don't show up if you're infected for at least seven days really in the data, because you have to then get a test and that test result has to come in and you might not get a test. You don't tend to get hospitalized until 10 to 12 days after you've been infected. So that doesn't depend on you getting tested, but it depends on you being the kind of person who might be hospitalized. So if you're a young person, that's not gonna be you, unlike why I like to be you. And it kind of tells you what things were happening 10 days ago to that cohort of patients. And death again, you know, is three to four weeks after infection. So this is where, if you don't understand that, you can take really wrong conclusions of the impact of your mitigations. And we've seen that over the summer. And so one of the problems was that they were opening up things every two weeks between June and August in the UK. But because of these lags, it will take at least two weeks and more like three or four weeks before you would see any impact on what you've done in the data. And so if you open up too quickly, you have no way of knowing if you're making things worse and then you're just carrying on opening. Um, and it also means that, that, especially when you couple it with exponential growth, is that if you make a policy decision now that will change people getting infected tomorrow, it will not help hospitals for two weeks. So if you don't make a decision until hospitals are overwhelmed, then you're just condemning them to two weeks of pain. Um, and I think kind of making those kind of things really clear was so important, well, it is important still. There's also been a lot of confusion around um, what the tests mean, the COVID tests mean. There's been all this discussion over the summer and what is a false positive? And I'm not going to go into it, but I think that caused a lot of confusion um, and it kind of led to a lot of skeptics kind of misusing the data to kind of promote a certain point of view. Um, and understanding age, I mean, you know, David Spiegelhout has been brilliant on this, but there's such a, a, such a stark age profile of risk for COVID. And what that means is that if it's spreading in a less risky population, like a younger population, you will not see it in hospital or death data. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter because there's no country in the world that has managed to just confine COVID infection to young population. It hasn't happened. At some point, young people will mix with older people. And then once it's in one, a few older people, they then mix with other older people and then it spreads through that generation and it takes off. And that does happen. It can take three, four, five weeks. And the problem with that three, four, five weeks is it builds complacency. And that's what we've seen, not just in, in the UK, but everywhere. And I think this kind of um, lack of understanding has created real problems. And so where data can science help with that? Well, firstly, just designing data collection and research design that is fit for purpose and really helps us to answer the questions that we need to do. Um, it's too late, really, for this pandemic, but the next one. 
And communication and understanding of science, like we can't just always want to be doing the data science. Sometimes the best thing you can do is to communicate um, and, and help people understand what is going on. Contact tracing is the key to pandemic control. All the countries that have done best with COVID have got really good contact tracing in place. And the reason is that if you have an infected person here, and these are all the people they're in contact with until they get symptoms and hopefully isolate themselves, um, then what you wanna do is find the people they're in touch with while they were likely to be infectious. Isolate all of these people, which will hopefully include anyone who's infected. So in this case, the red and orange person, and then they will not infect the other people. So it's through isolating the contact of a new infected person that you break that chain of transmission. And then what you're doing is you're saying, most people can carry on life as normal, but we're going to tell the people who are most likely to have COVID not to go out and not to infect people. And if you don't have good contact tracing, and if you have an out of control pandemic as Europe is currently having, your only choice then becomes a kind of lockdown time measure where you make everybody isolate. You just take everybody and say, well, I don't know who of you have got COVID, so I'm just gonna make you all stay at home. And it works, but it's incredibly inefficient and incredibly damaging. Um, and the other key thing just here about pandemic control and, and contact tracing is it has to be quick. You have to be isolating um, these infected people within three days of a test because you, you need them to stay at home before they become infectious. So what's gone wrong? Um, well, most things, to be honest, our contact tracing system has not been a great success. There was too much reliance on an app in March and April and May, it was all about the world beating app that they wanted to design from scratch um, and kind of centralized solutions like central call centers. And an app is useful, but never on its own is it going to take the place of all the other kind of contact tracing um, methodology. There is a disregard for public health expertise. Public health teams do contact tracing every day. They do it for sexual diseases. They do it for things like measles. They know how to do it and they know how to talk to the communities. Um, there's little or no support for isolation in the UK. We have the least financial support for people isolating in the EU. Um, and you have to be on benefits to get it. So a lot, most people can't afford to stay home for two weeks. There are caring responsibilities. You might be in overcrowded housing and you can't, you know, it's not safe for you to stay at home because you might infect other people including vulnerable family members. But we have no option to say, well, we can put you up in a hotel and look after you um, for two weeks. I've already talked about how we haven't been using the data um, very well for contact tracing. And there's also been really poor data storage and transfer. I mean, just like, you know, there was Excel gate in September where they lost 16,000 test results. So data science can help with some of this, right? It can help and it has helped in the app design rollout and use. I know the Turing's been involved in that. It can help with data collection and research design. But fundamentally, unless people get tested, unless they're willing to provide contacts and unless they're supported to isolate, all of that is pointless because that's how it works. And that isn't a data science problem. That's a public health and communication and behavioral science problem. Um, the kind of the last thing that's gone wrong that I want to talk about a vulnerable population. So the first one is, is care homes and residents. So here, this red, um, this red line is deaths in care homes. And you can see they have formed a big proportion of deaths in the first wave, but it's actually not just residents. It's also staff of care homes, um, who are vulnerable, a lot of them are agency staff, they don't earn very much money, they move between different care homes, and most, a lot of them don't get sick pay, they can't afford to self-isolate. Um, and, and, and what's happened is that that kind of combination has meant that staff are kind of forced to work if they're sick, um, or if they've been contacted because they can't afford not to, and then they kind of spread infection around and then residents get sick. And once one person has it in a care home, it spreads extremely quickly. Key workers, and which isn't just people in the NHS or teachers, it's also taxi drivers, security guards, retail assistants, people in public facing roles who had to carry on working were exposed to COVID much more than other people. Um, they're much more likely to be from minority ethnic communities, to be women, 
to be born outside the UK and to be from lower income groups. 15% of them are at moderate risk of COVID because they have a health condition. Um, minority ethnic groups were much more impacted by COVID in the first wave than they are in the second wave. This is the second wave. Um, and this is predominantly Asian communities have much higher rates of COVID than non-Asian um, non communities. Deprived communities also much more impacted. The most deprived communities are this light blue, this light blue line here from PHE data. And apart from the university age group, which isn't surprising, they are by far the most infected group. So data science can help not that much with this problem. This is a massive issue, but this is a public health issue. This is an economic issue. Um, and our job there is to insist that public health experts and social scientists are in the room. You know, we can and we should advocate for expertise other than our own. I think there is a kind of, especially in this government, a temptation to go for data science, to go for AI, to go for the the kind of really snazzy scientific solution. But sometimes that's not the solution. Sometimes it's public health, sometimes it's inequalities um, and education. And we should advocate for that if we know that it's not, it's not us, we can't help with that. So just to summarize, you know, more varieties of expertise help reduce the unknown unknowns. There's been a lot about this pandemic where you've said, if only we had known that X was a problem. Um, and some people did know they just weren't in the room. And I think that's where um, having a really broad coalition of expertise that can work together is so important. And I think there's also has to be an emphasis on public health. I felt like a lot of the UK's pandemic response has been very reactive. It's about what well, we have to protect the NHS. And because of that focus, it's been much less on prevention. It's, it's how do we protect vulnerable communities? It's how do we protect older people? How do we um, prevent infection through contact tracing and isolation? And I feel like that has taken a back seat and we paid for it with really high infection rates and deaths. The more boring prep work is absolutely crucial. Um, and this is ensuring the right data is collected and um, it has to be collected in the right way, ensuring that it's consistent, reproducible, usable, transparent, the COVID UK data is a bit of a nightmare to use. There's a lot of it, but it's all in different places. It's in different formats. It means different things. It's changed over time. It, it's incredibly difficult to try and get a picture of what COVID is doing in the UK. Um, understanding the limitations of real-time data, a lot of really advanced data science isn't really suitable to this situation because the data is not good enough. There's so many gaps in it. It's never really real-time. And the more real-time it is, the worse it is. Communication is crucial. Don't spin, don't help others to spin. I mean, I think, I think David Spiegelhaus talked about that earlier. You know, if you need, you need to trust, you don't learn anything from trying to present the best possible picture. And this is where I think a lot of data science, at least for me, I've decided that I can be most helpful by emphasizing the basics to policymakers and the public, you know, trying to explain exponential growth in R, which is still really misunderstood and misused. And people take the wrong conclusions from data because of it. For instance, thinking that the Southwest was fine because cases were low, even though they were increasing really rapidly. I was like, well, they're out of control, even if right now it looks okay. The nature of uncertainty and evidence and the nature of modeling is, is just so important to explain um, how that works. Ask whether your favorite type of data science is actually helpful. I think at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone wanted to help, including me. And you know, the way that the academic community and others mobilized was incredibly inspiring. Um, but I think for me, actually, what I did in those first two months wasn't that helpful. You know, I didn't end up being that helpful because I didn't really stop and think, is this the right place for me? Am I contributing? Um, and then finally, just you know, plan for the next pandemic because it is coming. And I'm really worried that when COVID's over, everyone's just going to forget about it and be like, oh, thank God that's over, because it's not over. There will be another pandemic. Probably, I'm not going to say when, but it is coming. And we should be better prepared next time. And uh, that's it. <laughs>